and hello everyone welcome back to our stream we're at episode six on our CICD pipeline journey uh, I'm excited about continuing where we left off last time and we're talking about CML right I had some issues with CML I had opened a ticket with support which by the way uh, they follow up with me on the same day so they sent me a, an email back hey what's going on so we checked um, last Wednesday and it turns out that actually the license was expired so um, I just renewed the license one of the perks of being a Cisco employee is that you get free access to CML between many other perks but one of them would be that I get you know an instance of CML enterprise that I can use in my lab uh, which is super cool because I'm a big fan of CML what used to be like I said viral so Cisco modeling labs we'll have a look today at CML right and show you my test network which you know you could have something similar uh, you could build uh, CML network, you could have your own uh, rack of devices, hardware devices, routers, switches, topology, however you want to set it up. But I'm going to show you my setup and what I'm going to use as my test environment. So we're going to go and have a look at that. And then we also started talking about Ansible last time. Right, so we're going to talk, uh, keep going with Ansible. Uh, let's see if we can finalize the Ansible playbook for configuring OSPF on our Nexus switches. So if you can get that today, maybe even get started with the Docker image, uh, that would be great progress, right, for today. So um, quick recap, just to make sure that everybody is on the same page. We have GitLab installed, right? You have to see, see it in the background here running. Uh, we have that CICD folder, right, where I'm putting the configurations, everything that uh, needs to be as part of the pipeline in there. Uh, so creating the environment, we've built the shell scripts, the Docker compose files, all of that is in there. Um, so we have GitLab, we're gonna have a look at CML also today, which is our test environment. Uh, we're gonna finish up Ansible, like I said, which is gonna be the tool that we're going to use as part of the pipeline to perform the configuration changes that we want. In uh, in our example here, we're going to configure OSPF on a couple of Nexus virtual switches. So uh, yeah, let's let's get started. Uh, hopefully, you folks can hear me and see me. Uh, let me see who we have in the chat. Uh, okay, I see a couple of users. You folks, let me know if you have any questions also throughout uh, the stream. At any point, uh, drop a message in there. Um, and there was a question last time that I caught after the stream. I ended actually what version of um, VMware ESXi I'm running in my lab environment is still 6.7. So I believe it's a fairly old version by now. But it's a lab environment, it works for the purposes of what I need to do. So I'm not really gonna spend too much time upgrading that um, as of yet. Uh, all right. Let's see. Uh, have a look at, like I said, CML. So let me connect to my uh, to my lab environment and see if I can access now my CML instance 33 there we go login and status is okay here if you remember last time we had issues with the licensing so it was just a license renewal like i was saying version 2.3 right so it's 
the, their own 2.5.1 has been recently released at the end of April. Um, I might upgrade this at some point, like I was saying, but for now, for what I need, it, it, it does the job. It's fine. So I have my uh, simulated network here. So if you're new to CML, I'm just going to quickly walk uh, around and show you what it is, the interface, what options you have. So you can uh, either import, right, uh, previous topology, lab topology file, uh, either as a YAML file or dot viral for viral .x. So the nice thing with CML is that you build your topology, right, with your devices, your virtual switches, routers, firewalls, whatever it is, you interconnect them, you configure them, you have IP addressing on them, you have routing features enabled that you want to test, all of that. And the nice thing with CML is that you can take a snapshot of that topology of all those devices, all the interconnections, all the links between them, uh, all the annotations that you make, right? If you had any comments or anything, all of that gets saved uh, as a YAML file. Right, so you can easily export that topology file. Uh, for your CML instance, you export it as a YAML file it contains everything about that topology, all the configuration of the devices, every single thing. So then you can share with somebody else that YAML file. You, know, you can give it to your colleague, you can bring it to work, whatever it is, you can bring it on a new instance of, of CML. And it's very easy to save topologies and then import them, right? And move them around, share them. Like I said, it's it's incredibly easy. So that's one way of creating a topology. So it's like importing it, or you can just, you know, create a new one from scratch. You do a, a, an add over there, and then you can just drag and drop virtual devices here from the right-hand side, it popped up a, um, a window with what devices, what virtual devices uh, I can use as part of my topology, as part of my virtual setup. So here I have a virtual ASA. I have a Catalyst 8000V. So these are the new ones, right? Um, the Catalyst 8000s, iOS XC latest versions available for you to test here in CML. You have your, what is now end of life, CSR 1000V, so your cloud services router, right? This has been around for, for many, many years now. Uh, your iOS V, so your virtual instance of old school iOS, iOS XR for iOS XR for service provider. Um, you have iOS XR V9000. You have Alpine, right? So this is like simple, very bare bones Linux. You could use that as a host, as a client, right? So you get an IP address, you can do pings, you can do curls to search, to, to actually check for web server statuses, right? You can install iPerf for performance testing. So you have iPerf client server on one of these, on a couple of hosts. You have your server and your client on different hosts and then you start pulling traffic between them, right? You can generate 10 megabits per second, 100, one gigabit, whatever it is. And then you can start seeing how traffic flows, if you have any shaping, policing happening, right? QoS um, enable, then you can start seeing if there's any drops, what's happening, how traffic is being routed. Um, then you have CoreOS, which I believe is also some type of uh, Linux. You have a desktop server T-Rex for traffic generation, a different one than iPerf. Uh, you can even get a full Ubuntu if you so want, uh, a Ubuntu VM, if you're more familiar with that. Um, and then what we're going to have here an NXOS 9000, right? So this is like your typical NXOS virtual switch. Um, and then an admin switch. So for Nexus, you know, X, iOS XR V, CAT 8000 V. So you have the three main operating systems from Cisco. You have for enterprise iOS XC with Catalyst 8000 V. Latest versions, right? So you have the latest features. Um, 
with the service provider, you have the iOS XR V9000. So that gives you service provider coverage, all the features, latest versions of iOS XR. And NXOS 9000V, that gives you data center, right? Nexus operating system. So you have full coverage, well, very good coverage and also with the ASAV of at least the enterprise service provider data center operating systems uh, straight up here latest versions latest features in cml now there's limitations on the traffic that you can push through these devices and there's some um, features that are dependent on that are hardware dependent All right so there's an asic uh, dependent feature in this switches routers then you know you're not gonna get access to that because this is a virtual version of that there's no asics there's no accelerated forwarding or any uh, you know special integrated circuit as part of this you're, i'm running it on a um, intel you know ucs server um so there's nothing optimized right so if there's any features that are hardware dependent you're not going to have access to them but for the most part you'll get access to all the other features uh and like i said with with t-rex and iperf you can also see how traffic is being forwarded and you will be limited also on the um, amount of data traffic that is being forwarded by these devices right So it's as easy as, you know, just dragging and dropping them to your canvas here. Uh, there we go. So I have an access switch. I can get a CAT 8000V. Uh, and I can get a CSR 1000V here. And then I can start interconnecting them. So you have this uh, link here. I'm going to connect from my Nexus switch. I'm not going to connect the management, but I'm going to connect the ETH11 two gigabit one that's fine create link and i'm gonna go from this and i'm gonna connect from the cat 8000 gig one to gig two because gig one is already taken it's connected to the nexus switch all right so i'm gonna just connect it to gig two create link so there you go it's as easy as that of dragging dropping devices interconnecting them and then, of course, once you're connecting them the way you want, you'll just start them up. And you see the icon of, okay, so this one is turning uh, green. You see the icon of like a clock, a watch over there. So that means that, oh, there we go, they're coming online. And a new window popped up here activated which is that's the interconnection link right start stop and this is the terminal you can actually get access to the console of these devices and see them as they boot up super cool all right so the nexus is is coming online here uh you see the cpu utilization at the bottom here for cml the memory the disk right and the notifications and status okay so here they're you know they're being brought online there you go my nexus is coming on um and well that is okay so a couple more folks joined welcome everyone to the stream Hope you folks enjoyed this. Um, so what is unsquashing good FS? So it's coming on. Let's see the CSR 1000V at the same time. What's going on? This one is also coming online. And then the CAT 8000. This one is also coming online. So they're all, you know, taking the time a bit here to boot uh, right so very straightforward um, now can you add extra devices would be a question right you have these that come with CML out of the box 
So you purchase CML, you installed it, right? Um, you have, you added this, it, I believe it comes as um, a separate file with the definition of these images when you purchase CML. You got it, you got the license, you installed it, you installed images. These are the ones on the right hand side here that you see on my screen that come out of the box with CML. You want to add third party devices, you can want to add, you know, a Juniper switch in here or a router or an Arista switch or a load balancer from Citrix or whatever the case may be. You can that as long as they have um, virtual instances of those devices, then you can definitely have. If I'm looking CML third party devices support, let's see what we get. Wow, Google, come on, what's going on? I'll show you one that loads up, but basically you can add your own definitions of devices. There's a step-by-step -step guide on how to do this. Uh, let me just see. Hey Google, why aren't you not working today? Uh, Yahoo? <laughs> Cisco.com? Okay, Yahoo is working. Cisco.com? I haven't used Yahoo to search for something in a long time. CML third party device support. Let's see. Oh, Cisco CML. <laughs> Let's see if that changes anything. Using and configuring. Uh, CML third party. Add third party on Reddit. There's a topic here too. Uh, to, to, oh, a 40 gate VM to CML, right? So we can even have 40 gate, which is working great. The evaluation license will be expired uh, at the 40 gate. Check if it's using two gigabyte of RAM. Uh, come on, loading network. So we're gonna see here. It's basically um, a guide. CML. I believe they also have a GitHub repo with definitions and step on how to use this. Um, so let me see what happened here. Did it come online? So at the bottom here, you see the window, right? So more information about each node. So this is the node name, uh, simulate, start, stop, wipe node, right? image definition, I have only one here, it's not active. Because it's running, I cannot change the RAM CPU and the CPU limit here. Uh, but you see simulation statistics, right? So it started CPU, it's about 3%, uh, a bit more than a gig of RAM. And uh, 885 that are written here. Connectivity, how they're interconnected. So I have my Ethernet 1.1 one, one, connected Gabit 1 on the CSR, you get access to the console, VNC. So if you have uh, Ubuntu server or one of the Linux servers, you can have a VNC connection to them. 
edit configuration here in case you want to input any startup configuration, right? You would add it here. Uh, and then the interfaces that are available on this virtual device. Uh, okay, so this one is still coming online. My CSR should be up and running. Uh, okay, enable. All right, so I have a, what is this? 2021, it's 17.3.48. CSR 1000V. Uh, with how many interfaces? Four gigabit interfaces and one management. All right, so if I do my show run configuration, you see you get uh, your typical CSR 1000V here. Um, okay, so next is now you want to look for the green check mark thing here. That means that the device is online. So if it's anything but a green check mark, it means that it's still booting or it's in the process of starting up. Um, so let me connect and see. We'll give it a bit more time here to see if it comes online. And then the cat 8K seems to also be online. And there we go. We have a catalyst 8000B. And this one is 1761. It's been up for six minutes. And that's pretty much how you would start. Come on, Axis. So then another important thing would be your external connector. I was mentioning this. So the external connector, what it does, and let's configure it. I'm going to do the port to gig four, my last port on the CSR 1000V, create link. And I'm going to start. So my external connector provides connectivity to the uh, outside world, right? So it basically hooks into the interface that you have on CML, uh, this 10, 10, 10, 33, right? It kind of piggybacks off of that interface to give you access to the outside world to whatever access this interface has. So if this 10, 10, 10, 33, which is part of my lab, if this subnet network has access to internet, then your simulated environment by using the external connector and piggybacking off of that interface will also have access to the outside world, to the lab environment, uh, right? To after that, the internet. So that is really cool because once you have a Ubuntu, like I said, you can install, do updates, you can install your own packages on a Ubuntu VM. So you can, you know, build a full blown simulation with internet connectivity. And not only internet connectivity, you can also have a lab connectivity, right? So that comes first. So if I have any other devices in this 10, 10, 10, uh, subnet or 10, 10, 20 or 30, whatever it is. If I have other switches, routers, um, that traffic can be routed between them, right? Between my virtual instances and that lab equipment, then it's going to work or SPF is going to establish, right? They're going to be able to see each other. Um, and they're going to be able to communicate and have a network between all these devices, both virtual, physical, and also cloud you could have uh, an sd-wan instance in aws or azure or you know gcp whatever the, uh, the case may be okay so um for the edit config have them in uh, nat mode so that means that the traffic is being matted 
um, through this connector bridge, it's just bridging. So you're gonna have 10, 10, 10, 34 in here, right? So we'll just bridge between them, act as a layer two bridge. That is gonna do your layer three netting, network address translation. So it would actually uh, net anything from your virtual setup. All of these three devices here uh, will be netted to that 10, 10, 10, 33 IP address, right? And then forward it outside and uh, net is the default option here for your external connectivity. So let's see, are they all online? And Nexus is still loading. <clears throat> so now for this, right, let me quickly see. Uh, in gig four, if I do a no shut, is it gonna come up? Do show app interface brief. Okay, it's up, up because it's connected to that external connector. And let me see if I actually put an IP address on it. Uh, what should I do? 133. Let me see if I can uh, ping that. Is it being that that is not bridged? Um, what else do I have? 254. Do show IP route, let me just see. Oh, it's actually the management interface, right? Um, so that's not right here. Delete link. Confirm. Let me configure this. Can I? Oh, it doesn't have a management. Um, the CSR 1000 V would be the management link. Uh, let me go back and see quick. Uh, do show IP VRF. Do we have a okay? So this actually doesn't have any VRFs. Um, doesn't have a management VRF. Doesn't have a management interface. Uh, so 10, 10, 10, 133. It's not working and to 54 is not also let me set up a default gateway here a default route Let's see what happens uh, Zero 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 ten 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 two fifty four. So it's there, right? I have a default gateway. I have my interface is up up. I have my external connection configured. But this is not working. Hmm. Okay, let's go back to my other simulation, my other lab, and we'll have a look in there. But I uh, will check from there too. Uh, but yeah, this is basically how you get your simulation going, right? Let's see if the next is online. This is still powering up, still coming on. So uh, it takes quite a bit of time. All right, so now let's get back here. All right, CML third-party support. You see, got on importing Juniper, VMX, 
uh, and QFX into CML 2.4, A10, uh, Firepower Threat Defense, I put an OVA in GCP as a central SVM and I was able to put on VMware, it's not asking. Adding Junos to CML. <clears throat> so you see here, discussions, uh, questions, right, about how to get third party images uh, as part of your CML instance, as I, and I know that it's, it's possible to do it. Um, all right, look at this. So the Nexus is still booting up. It's been uh, quite a bit of time here. Let me just show you once it's back online and then we'll just stop this show and go back to my simulation that I have the other lab. So now another cool thing that's happening with CML is that, oh, there we go. So let me see if I do Cisco, Cisco. And you have your Nexus switch, right? With a bunch of interfaces. Show interface status. 64 interfaces on this one, it's quite a bit. Um, what version is it? 9.3. So the thing is I have CML 2.3. Like I was telling you, right, if you have upgraded to the CML 2.51, which is the latest one, then you'll get fresher images also. So keep that in mind. As you upgrade your CML to a newer version, you have the option of also upgrading uh, the virtual images that you have as part of CML, right? So you get newer CSR 1000V, newer CAT 8K images as, you know, as you upgrade CML, you also get the upgraded images. That's, that's cool. That's why I have older images here because I'm still running to that three uh, and I didn't upgrade the images yet or CML for that matter. Um, so I was telling you about third party devices and I also was telling you about uh, other cool. I'm going to stop this cool feature of CML is that is built uh, API first. So these are all stopped. I'm going to stop this one too. And then I'm going to delete them. I'm actually going to delete the whole simulation, uh, which is this one right here. I'm going to wipe it. Are you sure you want to wipe the lab? Yes and I'm going to delete it. Okay. So that's that, right? Showed you how easy it is to bring up and then delete. It's just as easy as that. I have one already simulation running in here and talking about cool features, uh, with CML is that is built API first. So you actually get access to the, um, API documentation. And you can actually get access to the Swagger spec, Swagger specification for CML. So pretty much every single thing that you can do, every single action that you can do in the GUI, right, in the web interface here, uh, in the background is just an API call that's happening, right? Whenever I create on add a new simulation that creates a new lab, right? So that's just an API call that's being done and that would be on the labs, right? Create a new labs would be a post call. I want to create a new lab. So the nice thing is that you can automate all of this, right? Once you get access to the API and to the API to open um, the Swagger Open API spec here, you can automate everything and have this as part of an automated pipeline that we're talking about, right? So you can have your CICD pipeline programmatically create a lab for you, right? With using a post call, create a lab with these devices interconnected in this way, or you can have, if you have it saved as a YAML file, as a topology file, like I was telling you earlier, 
you can load up that topology file into CML and just start your devices programmatically, right? So you see here the labs. If I go under, where is it, uh, node, right? I can add a new load to a specified lab. Uh, I can um, start the nodes. Let's see where we, where would we have add a node, delete a node. Uh, this endpoint is deprecated. Get interfaces, get a status, start the specified node in the specified lab, right? So I can start my nodes, I can configure them programmatically, passing configuration, right? So you can automate the whole thing, everything that I've showed you in the GUI here in the web interface with adding devices, starting them, configuring IP addresses, routing, default gateways, all of that. You can do it programmatically, right? So everything you can do that automatically by using this uh, the API that CML provides. That's huge, right? And as you start looking into the CICD pipelines, for me, uh, as part of my pipelines, I'm actually thinking about doing the next step this, but I'm assuming that the uh, that my setup is always running, right? I'm assuming that my devices are always there and that my simulation is always on, which it is most of the time, except when I have a licensing issue like I had last time and I had to fix that. But this lab is running all the time. So let's go and have a look at the, at my lab here. It's um, similar to the one before, it's just a couple of CSR 1000 Vs here running. And then a couple of Nexus 9000 Vs with the, the inside hosts. I was telling you just to check traffic, right? Pings, if I can get that. And then I have my bridge to outside here, which is my external connectivity. And it is a bridge in this case, configured as a bridge. Right? And I just have a DOM layer to switch that is just gathering all uh, is a basic layer to switch that just acts kind of like a concentrator for all the other connectivity, all the other devices to get access to the outside world from their management interfaces or whatever interface they may be, right? So on this, on the CSR 1000 with the router one, if I look here, I see that is my gigabit Ethernet one that's being connected to the switch. So that's my management network that would have an IP. If I go on this switch on gigabit one, right? Show interface status, show IP interface brief, gigabit one, you see here is 10, 10, 10, 175. Uh, so that's in the same subnet as the 10, 10, 10, 33. So actually, let me see if I do a ping 10, 10, 10, 33. Okay, so that's not working, but let me see if I do a 254. Let me see if there's a VRF now on this. Because I can connect from the outside world to that 10, 10, 10, 175. Let me show you. So if I do an SSH, Cisco at 10, 10, 10, 175. Right, I'm on distribution router one. Show running gig one. Oh, and it is a VRF. So it is the management VRF, right? So then if I do a ping of 10, 10, 10, 254, there you go, right? So it's a different VRF. Let me see if I get it 33. 33 also works. So I can ping the 
interface, the lab interface of my CML instance. And I can also should be able to do 20. I have another subnet in there, 20, right? 30, 30. So I have several different subnets. So if I would have other network devices in, in those subnets, right? I could actually uh, connect to them. Uh, what about, let's see, 4222. And I have even internet access, right? And then your Google DNS server, which would be, I was like 8888. So even I have internet access. So then if you start enabling guest shell on these devices, right? You get internet access uh, that way. So I have my router uh, configuration. I just have OSPF configured on them. Uh, let me show you. Fairly straightforward configuration. Oops. Um, interconnections between all these devices, right? You see here I have three interfaces that are being connected to the core router. Uh, one, core router two, distribution switch one, distribution switch two. Uh, what else we have here? Distribution router two. So there, all interconnected. Do I see show CDP neighbor? CDP is not enabled. Okay, so I don't actually see that. But so that's my 175, right? You'll see similar to this on this other on router two. Let me quickly show you. This would be 176. This should be 177 and 178. So if I do show IP interface brief on this, uh, VRF management, I see it's 10, 10, 10, 177. And this is gonna be 178. management right 178 uh then i have ospf configured on them should if i show ip ospf neighbors they're all interconnected i have um, ospf configured spf process one area zero so they're all in area zero all these four devices interconnected uh, show IP route or SPF, learning bunch of OSPF routes, right? Right, perfect. So this will be my test environment. Before we wrap up, quickly going back to um, CML. So let me actually show you how this goes, how this works. You can um, start interacting with it from this interface too. So authenticate the system, try it out. Oh, but I have to authorize first. Uh, it's authorized value. Okay, so it's closed. Authenticate the system. What does it show me? Uh, it is a forbidden because I have the wrong credentials here. Uh, let's see if I create a user uh, sample labs, node and image definitions, uh, diagnostics, upgrade system, licensing, system administration, user administration. I have my body mal here with an account. Let me add a new account. Add user, call it Twitch, password, uh, 
Grant the mutual privileges. Submit. Don't save. So then I can come here and do a Twitch. And my super safe password of Cisco123. So if I execute this, I got a 200 response body okay, right? So I'm authenticated. I have my token here. Uh, and now I should be able to get a list of the labs. I don't want to create a new lab. I just want to get a list of all the labs. So if I try it out here, whether to show only labs owned by the admin or all user labs. I want to show all user labs. Uh, and actually I see here I got a code of 200 as a response. So I know it went well, it responded okay. And these are the two labs because the other one still shows up. Should have only one. Let me do it. Okay. So there we go. This is for whatever reason, it thought that the other one is still there. It's gone, the one we uh, I showed you. So I only have one lab with this ID, right? So now if I copy this ID of the lab, I should be able to get the devices, right? So let me go, I'm done with the labs. I wanna see the nodes. And I want to get the list of all the nodes for a specific lab. So uh, try it out. This is the lab ID that I got in the previous step. So if I execute this and there we go, right? These are the IDs of all the devices in that lab. Right, so I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. If I go back, this actually should be eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight devices in here, right? Uh, so you get the IDs of each of the devices and then you can parse, okay, I got the device uh, ID of this device. If I go and let's see what we can do. Uh, get tags. Let's see if we can get interfaces for that device, right? Or links. Interfaces. Oh, but it's lab ID, node ID, right? So you see how you kind of have to programmatically do this, save the lab, lab ID, then uh, get the node IDs, then iterate through each of the node IDs, see what interfaces they have. Um, node definitions, image definitions, licensing, everything is exposed over the API. So you can get the license, you can update programmatically the license. Um, yeah, so every single thing that you can do in the GUI, right, is exposed over an API. It is an API call in the backend, like I was saying. Uh, all right, so I showed you how to use the Swagger Open API with CML. Uh, let me see, are there any questions from folks? Uh, I don't see any questions. Uh, so I will assume that folks, it's everything clear for you. Um, all right, so we have 10 minutes here. I ran a bit long with CML, but I think it was helpful for you. What else I wanna show the dashboard, I have the lab, I showed you how to instantiate images. Uh, I showed you the API documentation, um, the client library. So there is actually a Python library right, the Varl2 API client library is a Python package that you can use to programmatically 
uh, interact with your CML instance through Python. So since I have 2.3 is a bit older, I believe with 2.5, they also changed CML to client here. Um, so you have a Python library, right? Which is super cool. Pip install viral two underscore client. How you install it, pip install, right? And then how you start using it, import client library, right? Uh, would be usage. And do we have any examples? Yeah, we have examples. So from viral to client, import client library, right? And you just create a client connection to your instance of CML, you provide the username and password, the link, and you have your Python object created as a hook into your CML instance, and then you can do create labs in Python, right? Create the node, it's R1, name, it's a type iOS V, and 5100 will probably be the coordinates where it gets put on this canvas here, right? Would be actual coordinates X and Y of where it's getting placed on the canvas. Uh, creating interfaces between them, right? Starting, stopping up labs from Python, super cool. So there's a Python library for that. There's also an Ansible module. If you want to use Ansible, to instantiate, create labs, start them, stop them. So there's also an Ansible module. And for the past four or five months, they also have a Terraform provider for CML. So if you have a Terraform environment, you're more familiar with Terraform and you want to use that to interact with CML, you can. There's a Terraform provider now for CML. What else I wanted to show you? Upgrade system, licensing, and then it's pretty much it's settings and logout. Um, really cool. I'm a big fan of CML. Um, I'm using it as my test environment for my CICD pipeline, and we'll see uh, how it comes the picture uh, into our pipeline. Okay. So next, if you remember, we started configuring Ansible last time. So let's see what we have here. I uh, probably didn't do a git push. So let me do a new window, connect back and go and show you, right? See if we can finalize to apply the latest uh, later. So I'm gonna do a remote connection. I wanna connect to this. Connecting current window. That's my CentOS. Later. Password. Remote connection into my CentOS image where I have GitLab running. And if I go now here, open folder. Home is fine. Home parallels, okay. And we have our make file. And password. Connecting to right here, right? The CentOS 9 image that we've set up previously. All right, so I have the group bars, right? Host bars, if you remember. So 10, 10, 10, 177 and 178 are actually this devices, this Nexus switches right here, right? If we go showed you this is 177 right and we have a very secure 
username of Cisco Cisco. That's getting taken from our group vars. Right, group vars and XOS. I have it here, Cisco 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 Cisco. <laughs> And then the two hosts, 177 and 178, those two Nexus switches. So they have these IP addresses on those interfaces, 13, 14, uh, and they are configured for SPF. All right? So you see. And then uh, next, let's go and create a new folder. We're going to call it Actions. And in the actions, we're going to build our Ansible playbook for configuring OSPF on these Nexus switches. Uh, so let me quickly move this out of the way. Exit here. Actions. Me. And then We'll create a configure OSPF folder, a uh, new folder quickly here. And we'll call it configure OSPF. Uh, okay, I went too deep. Let me remove this, uh, rename. I uh, will just do conf uh, actions, sorry. Um, let's pick this up next time. Right. Um, so we're going to do a configure OSPF playbook next time. That's what we're going to start with and the Docker part of this, uh, and how to build your Docker image with the prerequisites that you need for your pipeline. So we're going to have PyTS in there. We're going to have Ansible that's going to be uh, running our playbook that we're defining here. And those are the two main big ones. We want to have PyTS as part of our Docker container that's going to run the pipeline and Ansible. Those are going to be the two main components. So we'll pick this back up next week. We're going to start with Ansible and configuring our SPF. Before I sign off, let me see folks joining. Thanks so much again for the folks that have joined the stream. Hope you found it useful. And let me see any messages. Uh, I don't see any messages. So with that, I'll see you on the next one. Hope you, fo uh, you folks found this useful and we'll pick up with Ansible and finish Ansible next week because um, it's just the configure SPF part and it's a playbook. We're going to go over all the steps on how to build an Ansible playbook. We have the group vars, the host vars. These are variables that apply to the host vars for each individual host that you want to configure. 
and then the group vars are variables that uh, apply to a group of devices. In our case, we have the credentials Cisco Cisco for both switches. Um, and that's it. We'll see you on the next one. Thank you so much for joining. You folks take care and see you on the next one. Take care, everyone. Bye.